What it do, comic babies? I'm Bunkmaster B, and today we're filling in some gaps. See, I took a little break a little while ago, which is different than the break that I just took. 2024 has not been the most consistent year for me. Recently, I, uh, I was off YouTube for 100 days. And just because I wasn't making videos doesn't mean I wasn't reading some incredible books. Now, we've got a best of list that's going to be coming up for the year of 2024 pretty soon. Uh, as I'm filming this, it is uh, a little less than a week before Halloween. So we've only got two full months before the end of the year. But I really didn't want to let that time go uncaptured. And today, I want to talk a little bit about the 10 best books that I read during that time. Now, best is always going to be subjective, and honestly, it's closer to my 10 favorite books that I read during that time, with one caveat. I cannot have talked about any of these titles previously on this channel. So anything that I have talked about here before does not get a mention, and there has to have been a new issue that was put out during the time between my whatever video was in the hundred days that I was off of YouTube. Cool? Cool. Let's check it out. So we're going to start things off here and go alphabetical and talk about Bear Pirate Viking Queen. Now, when I first picked this up, the only thing I saw was that's a sweet picture of a bear. And I assumed that it was Bear Pirate, comma, Viking Queen. All sounds cool. Not the case. Uh, these are actually four different characters. This is a title that came out from Image, written by Sean Lewis, and really the reason that you're coming in is the art by Jonathan Marks Bervecchia. This book is some of the silliest comics that you are going to read, and it is some of the absolute most beautiful comics you're going to check out. It reminds me a lot of the art that was in Decorum that uh, came out a few years ago where it alternated between hyper-realistic and really well done and very, very stylized, all with this great watercolor wash that's going on. Basically, we're looking at a story that's uh, set during the height of the, uh, the British Empire, and we get you know, the, the titular characters on the front, the bear, the pirate, the viking, the queen, all kind of coming into play, ends up being a story about, um, you know, an attempt to overthrow the British monarchy. It's really silly stuff. It's very over the top. Uh, Sean Lewis is very clearly kind of writing some things just to set up uh, his boy Jonathan Marks, Better Vecchia. But this is the... Uh, this might be the most beautiful book that has come out this year. I mean, just the line work, especially that watercolor, it's a fantastic art book. The story, again, is just sort of there to set up the rest of it. But this book, uh, you need to check this out for the art alone. Bear, Pirate, Viking, Queen, absolutely recommend. Next up, we're going to be going over Dawn Runner. This is a series that came out from Dark Horse Comics, written by Rom V, and with art by Evan Cagle. This is the same team that's going to be taking on the new Fourth World title that's coming out uh, from DC Comics, and I can't wait for you guys to check this out, and especially Evan Cagle's artwork, because this guy is working on another level. Especially with the, uh, the colors coming in from Dave Stewart and, you know, my favorite non-biased letterer in the business, Aditya Bidikar. It's almost a little bit uh, Attack on Titan meets uh, Go Go Loser Ranger, where basically uh, humanity is on its last legs. It's in sort of these like little uh, city-states uh, that are set up, and it is being beset by these humongous big titans. Uh, these big monsters that are sort of uh, attacking them. And what they found is because humanity is in such dire state is that they can actually sell 
to the people there, uh, humanity's last defense. And so they've made a sports league out of people riding in these mechs to go and try and basically uh, kill these these big monsters that are attacking them. And the title, Dawn Runner, refers to this new mech that comes out for this, uh, the champion uh, that's there that's using a new technology that uh, she doesn't quite understand. And it turns out there's more going on than she expects. Um, she's tapping into some memories that she doesn't quite know. Uh, there's, and and it, the whole series is told between her the uh, these memories that she's accessing and the team that basically developed this new technology and that's happening um, as it goes on and it's only five issues we find out that there's more that's happening there both with the monsters with the people that are in charge and you know it's it's rom v you know it's written well i wouldn't say this is one of his strongest written series but that evan cale artwork is just fantastic anyone who is out there who is a dan mora fan is going to go nuts for this and honestly i can't wait for you guys to check this out not this specifically i would love for you to check out don runner but i can't wait for sort of the masses of comic fans to check out this team when that new fourth world comic comes out because i think people are just going to find out that this is an amazing, amazing team that needs to be read. So you guys know, I'm a huge Mark Russell fan. Mark Russell is basically a buy-on release day uh, writer for me. So when he comes out with a prestige format one-shot called Death Ratioed, which is basically where your standing in social media uh, determines not just your place in sort of the hierarchy of civilization, but also whether you live or die, you know I'm there for it. If you ever watch Community, uh, the whole premise of this book is uh, that basically um, we're in a almost post-capitalist society, but instead of capitalism, it's been replaced uh, where the currency is likes and dislikes. And uh, it's not of things, but of people. And everyone has what's known as a death ratio, where basically if you receive too many downvotes, any dislikes, uh, you are at risk of just dying. Uh, everybody has this collar that uh, you know just blows up if it uh, you know if if you get too low. And the whole premise here is that basically you know we get a ride along character who's gone into a coma and uh you know didn't get to see this sort of evolution of society so wakes up and finds uh that this whole new world is going on it it's pretty interesting um more than anything else it is just laugh out loud funny as you might expect from a mark russell book obviously there's a lot of social commentary that's happening there but it's all happening while you are absolutely just destroying yourself laughing mark russell writes the best you know i'm laughing so hard and wait a sec i'm thinking about what's going on here and it's so much more than just simply a social media bad facebook is destroying our country but it's really just a you know satire on our current civilization what we determine gives meaning to people and things there and just so good the scene where uh where uh basically praising the celtics giving a thumbs up to a guy wearing a uh larry bird jersey it's not larry bird but the, the thing says it's larry bird saves his life as a very proud boston celtics fan made me very happy so death ratio it's a one and done it's a 64 page from awa line work on this one by lassi or lacy uh, colored by Marco Lesco and lettered by Sal Cipriano. Um, it's it's fantastic. And again, all you got to do, just get the one issue and you got the whole story. If I told you that the creative team of Tom King and Bill Kasivli wrote one of the best books of the year, you probably look at me and be like, no duh, right? Off of their Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, we know that that is an absolutely superstar team packed with talent. 
Guess what? They're back at it again. Helen of Windhorn from Dark Horse Comics takes that same winning formula that works so well between them and tells a profoundly human story of supernatural grand experiences. Basically, the whole idea here is that we get a, a very sort of Robert E. Howard standing in uh, Conan story where we have uh, a novelist uh, who is, you know, uh, comes from high society, uh, unfortunately unalives himself and leaves his daughter, uh, who he had been living with, stranded. Her daughter is then uh, brought on to live with her grandfather at this high estate in Windhorn. And we hear the story of sort of her upbringing as told by her governess. Uh, Helen, the main character, is very headstrong, uh, you know, rebels against authority, and finds herself stuck in between two worlds. We find the high society world of Windhorn, and we find the fantasy world that exists beyond. It's a, it's a story of sort of finding her place between these two worlds. There's a, a secondary story that's happening sort of set in current day uh, about what's happening after the fact. That's all really kind of secondary to the story of Helen learning about all of this, learning about herself and sort of becoming uh, herself a fantasy character all with her grandfather Barnabas, who is basically a, a Conan type. All the while, Bilkis is drawing her butt off on this. I mean, she is going out. If you love Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, I honestly think she's taken a step up on this. I loved, loved, loved Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. Woman of Tomorrow was great. This is better. And the colors that uh, that Matthias Lopes is doing are works so well where in the fantasy league there are these beautifully saturated colors you know just really get this full spectrum versus when she's back at windhorn and life isn't quite as grandiose as it is there it's a little bit more sepia toned it's a little bit more muted it just works so so well and it just you read this book and you're like this is one of the best books that's coming out and there's just no other way around it um fantastic book it's going to be a lot on quite a few uh you know best of 2024 lists it's probably going to be on mine somewhere and uh, it absolutely deserves to be i know i said that uh, the caveat is i can't have talked about any of these books on a previous video i get that but i can't make this video and not put ice cream man number 39 and number 40 on this list. The two-part story, Decompression in a Crash, is absolutely one of the best things that I read this year. And those particular issues came out during this, so I don't care if I'm breaking my own self-imposed rules. This is making the list. So these two issues tell the story of a car crash. That's it. That is the entire thing. Um, it's, a, it's a reflection on sort of the, the decompression style of storytelling that exists in comics where you take uh, one very small event and you stretch it out and you tell the whole thing that's going on there. You know, typically this is going to be like a, a conversation. You know, think, think Brian Michael Bendis where you have a conversation with characters and you have just like head, 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 head. You get a nine panel grid of just going back and forth with the characters talking to each other. That's the central conceit of this particular issue where the whole issue takes place over the 20 seconds or so it takes of the car driving up and crashing. Issue 39, we get one car, the story of the people in that car. Issue 40, we get part two with the people in the other car that crashes into it. It's a fatal crash. The characters don't make it out. But the whole idea that comes with it is basically, um, you know, not only are we getting the events that lead up to that particular crash, but it's also the idea that uh, your life flashes before your eyes 
in you know the the time that you would die and so we get over the course of this the characters reflecting on their lives what put them there you know were they happy to be there and it's just this beautiful dark morbid character story about the people first a family and a sedan and then the two people uh that were in a delivery truck that were going there it's dark it's morbid it's ice cream man you expect that and it was fantastic you probably know i'm a huge zoe thorogood fan how much am i a zoe thorogood fan i am loving her writing even when she is not on illustrating duty life is strange is a book coming out from titan that uh, it's a spin-off of a video game series uh, that came out from Square Enix that was very much decision-based. Um, really, really interesting game series. Um, basically, the, the first one, uh, you go out and you are solving a mystery in a small town and the main character has the ability to uh, rewind time shortly. And you basically use that to have encounters with people, find out information, go back, change conversation, things like that. And so in the Life is Strange universe, it's this very character-driven universe of, of people that have particular powers and things that are going on there. And Forget Me Not is the story of these characters that are going through. Um, it's not the, the same characters from the original game that encounter a little girl who has the power to basically make people forget, but not just to make people forget, to take on their pain. And it's an interesting idea, and it's told in a really sort of heartbreaking way, where this little girl, you know, she, she started doing this when her parents were fighting, and she would see her mom after a fight, you know, would be crying, and she wanted to take that pain away from her mom. But what she didn't realize she was doing, she wasn't just taking the pain away from people. She was also taking the memories that associated that pain. And so what ended up happening is she ends up taking away basically like the entire memory of a deceased relative or you know, uh, from a divorce couple, the entire memory of the ex-spouse and whatnot. And it tells this really interesting way because the, the character who's doing this is a young child who doesn't know any better. And it's about sort of these people trying to help her, trying to set her free. Really, really interesting. Um, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I wish Zoe was, uh, was drawing it. Um, but it's, it's still strong enough uh, just off of Zoe's uh, story that it's worth reading and worth checking out. This is also no excuse for me to talk about one of my favorite issues of the year uh, that Zoe did, and that was back when she was doing Hack Slash Back to School. Now, this was coming out before I took my hiatus, thus I can't talk about it, but issue three of Back, uh, Hack Slash Back to School was one of my single favorite issues of the year. Uh, you get Zoe's artwork all throughout, and she's doing some absolutely fantastic stuff in just a really, really great character issue with some fantastic, horrific artwork. Um, you know, human spiders, basically all I need to say. Um, would highly suggest checking out this particular series in addition to Life is Strange. In fact, actually, if you could only check out one, check out uh, Back to School. But, like I said... Breaks the rules, and I already broke that once for Ice Cream Man. So, Life is Strange, Forget Me Not, is the series we're talking about here. Off the heels of my number 10 series uh, last year, we get a new Jesse Lonergan series, Man's Best. This is uh, Jesse Lonergan now writing with uh, Porsnack uh, Pinochet. Um, Apologies if uh, I mispronounced that. It's, uh, in some ways, it's, uh, it's homeward bound in space. Uh, basically, the idea is that we have three emotional support animals uh, who exist on a space station 
get separated from their owners and it's the story of them going to try and find their owners coming back of course there's way more to it than that um but it's just this incredible story of each of these sort of augmented animals. Uh, we have uh, uh, a cat, uh, we have a golden retriever, and we have a Boston Terrier, each who has kind of a, a separate thing that they can do uh, going through. I will tell you, first off, for anyone who is an animal lover, um, none of the animals die in, in this story. That's a spoiler alert, but... I know that that's a huge turnoff for some people. You see cute animals here and you say like, I need to know that going in. The animals don't die. You're good on that. There are some twists and turns where it turns out there's more happening here. And I mentioned at the beginning that this was coming off the heels of Jesse Lonergan's series Arco last year, even though that was, you know, they're not related at all, separate publishers, separate writers. It feels thematically very similar. To that in that basically they're both series about interstellar travel looking for you know basically a new start for humanity i might say that the story of arca was a little bit stronger but just because we have cute animals here uh that are moving around jesse's artwork gets to shine a little bit more um you don't have necessarily the same sort of breakdowns that you have um, if you're not familiar with jesse lonergan's art um, he has some of the best panel breakdowns and layouts of anybody in there and just highly technical breakdowns with circular, uh, you know, uh, repeating things like that. It's a terrible description of it, but if you've seen Jesse Lonergan's art, you go, yeah, I know what you're talking about. The characters are fleshed out so well. They feel like animals. They feel like characters. The story is... It, the plot isn't as important as sort of the story of the animals that goes through. And again, it's going to be fantastic artwork throughout. I love this story. This is going to be one that's probably going to be on my year-end list. If Jesse Lonergan makes a story, if he has any kind of art from here on out, it, it's probably shown up on my list. We were talking about amazing art before and series that are driven by it. We're continuing to do that now. Precious Metal, the uh, the prequel to Little Bird, uh, with the same creative team of Darcy uh, Van uh, Polgeist, uh, Ian Bertram, and Matt Hollingsworth, is for me worth the price of admission for that Ian Bertram artwork. I've I've talked before about the fact that Little Bird is a series I enjoy, but I don't love it the way that some people do. It's, uh, it tells, I think, a pretty convoluted uh, story about a rebellion on a religious state. Um, but Ian Bertram's artwork and just a horrifying body-changing thing. It, it's not necessarily body horror, but it does a lot. You know, It's very visceral, it's very graphic, and there's a lot of sort of body changes that happen with the people in that. And you get some of that going on, too. You take a look at the cover, you can see the main character, uh, the hunter, has basically all of these pink tentacles that are going on here. Basically, the whole premise, um, and honestly, it it feels a little bit Inkelly. Um, when I was reading this, I kept getting flashbacks to the Inkel. And it said before um, uh, Little Bird, I'm. you can read either one, um, I do think you get this is meant to be read after Little Bird because there are this is setting up uh, the world of Little Bird, not necessarily the events. And it follows uh, the hunter, uh, the main character of this, who is set to collect on a bounty of a child. When collecting the child, the child implants a particular memory on the hunter of basically the end of the world goes off, gives uh, the child to this group without thinking too much about it, collects his money, and realizes afterwards that this child is very, very important, and he never should have gone off and done that. And the entire rest of the story is the hunter trying to work with different groups to regain that child, try and put back what was undone. 
throughout that, you're going to get, um, again, the big, the big appeal of this series is seeing the world set up that is going to set up Little Bird, separate from just Ian Bertram's amazing artwork. Uh, once you get a little bit further in the story, you are going to see at least one character that you're going to recognize if you've read Little Bird. But mostly what you're going to see is thematically uh, a world that's changing towards what we recognize there. The more you like Little Bird, the more you're going to like this series. But even if you can't stand Little Bird, if nothing else, Precious Metal is a fantastic artwork and just showcase of Ian Bertram's amazing pencils. If there's one series on here that I think you've probably never heard of, it's going to be this one, and that is Seven Years of Darkness. Seven Years of Darkness, not an original idea at all. This is basically Harry Potter crossed over with Deadly Class. Deadly Class was already highly, highly compared to Harry Potter. But the idea is that this is a series that tells uh, the seven-year school story of a school of magic where only seven people will survive to the end and end up leaving. And the story, it, it's nothing original. But the tale that uh, writer-artist Joseph Schmalky is telling is highly, highly captivating. And I'm a big fan of Schmalky, and this is just a chance for him to tell the story that he wants to tell, to draw the things that he wants to draw. And it's amazing for that reason. Schmalky's mostly written on Smaller Plus, and this is a, a series that's coming out from a Comic Experience, uh, CEX, as you can see right there. Um, most of Schmalky's stuff before came out through Scout Comics, so things like Cherry Blackbird or We Don't Kill Spiders. Uh, so your mileage may vary on him, um, but I love a passion project, and this is so clearly a passion project. Um, the main character is, uh, you know, he's a little bit of a social outcast. He loves listening to alternative rock from the 80s. Uh, you know, he loves listening to heavy metal. Schmalky is himself a big metal head. And just sort of this world building that you get with sort of this dark necromancy, uh, these plots of all these different characters, the families running through, the children trying to murder each other while trying to stay on good graces. It's, it's a trip. This is not going to be a comic that changes the way you think about comics. But if you're looking for a ton of fun to have, this is one of the best series. We're on year two right now. Year one wrapped up last year. If you're interested in checking it out, uh, they haven't uh, come out with a trade, um, but uh, your shop can probably still order you the um, what they call the progress report, which was all four issues of year one, all put together, 10 bucks, one of the best deals out in comics. Check it out, you won't regret it. And lastly, and I feel weird about this, because you guys know when I'm trying to highlight books here, I'm trying to do smaller press stuff. I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do indies. I leave big two stuff to other people who are out there. You know, other comics YouTubers are much better at capturing what's going on with the big two. But when Dennis Camp is writing a book, I can't stay quiet. The Ultimates is so good, you guys. So marvel has the whole ultimate universe coming back going on and there have been some great books from there um i really like the first trade of ultimate spider-man being written by jonathan hickman um uh, that's not what we're talking about here that one it feels very familiar like a comic book um you know it's a it's a superhero book of a man who is trying to rekindle a life lost the Ultimates is Dennis Camp uh, writing awesome Dennis Camp things um, with artwork uh, here by Juan Frigeri and colors by uh, Federico Bli. This tells the story of the 16 or so months in between when uh, basically uh, 
the uh, the characters of Iron Man and Doctor Doom in the Ultimate version are trying to start this team, and the big bad, the Maker, is going to be unfrozen from time. And this book is at its heart a recruitment uh, recruitment mission of superheroes uh, to this new, you know, basically the Ultimate Avengers team, the Ultimates. What it really is is camps building up this ultimate world and redefining different classic characters that are going on. We find a new dynamic between uh, Giant Man and the Wasp. We find uh, newly incorporated uh, She-Hulk mythology, incorporating the nuclear tests on Bikini Atoll uh, that happened following World War II. This is a fascinating, fascinating world book that just happens to feature cool superheroes doing cool superhero things. Last year, my book of the year was Dennis Camp's 20th Century Men. I've made no secret to the fact that I love him as a writer. He is an instant day one buy. Just earlier today, I begrudgingly added uh, absolute Martian Manhunter to my pull list when that comes out later. I buy anything that he puts out. And I, until he's off the title, I'm going to keep buying this monthly. It's that good. Check it out. It's so good. And those were the titles that I loved during my 100 days off of YouTube. But I want to know from you guys, what do you think about this? I talked before about uh, my previous indie video, and uh, people said, yeah, I've already read those. I don't know why you're telling me about those. How about these ones? How many of these have you heard of? How many of these have you read? And how many of these have you loved? Of the ones that uh, you don't know about, are there any of these that uh, you think you might be checking out? Please, let me know down below in the comments. But with that, I've been Bunkmaster B. You all have been amazing. And I'll catch you next time. See ya.